Hi guys, welcome to my Foundry VTT tutorial and here we're going to show you how to create a ward and some of the most basic features that come in the vanilla version of Foundry. So we can see I'm running 0.3.3 .3 here and we're going to create our new ward tutorial. You can set a banner image if you'd like, but we're just going to jump straight into this, skipping over a little bit of that fluff, it's cool as it is. Set up a 5e ward. And away we go. Doesn't take it long to create it, and we're gonna log in as the game master to start. But then I'm gonna immediately hit the escape button and configure players. This is where we can create new users for them to log in. And I can even set passwords or access IDs for everyone to get in. There's no encryption here, so please don't use anything you care about getting out there. Okay, so now that we have a world set up with a couple of dummy accounts, let's take a look at this right hand pane. We can collapse with this little arrow, but we want it open because this is all most of our core features. We have the chat, we have the combat tracker, and this third one in is our scene tracker. So we're going to create a new scene, and we'll go open up a map I have on my computer already. So let's come into my assets folder that I've created here, and let's start off with a mansion. And let's do a reasonable resolution of that. We can see that right now I have token vision turned on and Fog of Exploration turned on. This is only seen by the Game Master and it is shown in Navigation. Navigation is this top bar up here. But you can see that little swirly icon? That means it's currently the active scene. So even though it's Game Master only, they can see it because it's the, what I want them to see. So here we have a nice, open, big map with all sorts of stuff going on. But we need to put in some walls and we need to get some players on here. Let's start off with creating a couple of dummy players. We're going to call them player 2 and player 3. I'm going to stick torch there in parentheses so we remember which one I'm going to give the torch to. So here on the torch, under the vision, I'm going to give it a mitting, which is this bomb pot, and we're going to stick a 40 20 in there and then update. I'm also going to come in here and link actor data and vision has vision. Okay, that's it on player three. Player two, we're going to link that data. We're going to give them dark vision. I normally do dark vision with 60 dim, 40 bright, but your game has to do a bit different. And so we now have those set up and configured. But we need to actually give them out to those players. So this one's going to be owned by player 2. And this one's going to be owned by player 3. Now as I drag these over onto the map. Oh, before we do that, let's make it so that their names and their HP sharp as well. So let's go back into their tokens. And up here, display name always. And then resources always and HP update. I'm going to do the same over here. And there's so much to configure here that you may not remember at all your first time. And that's okay. It's pretty easy to place and replace until you have the look and the feel that you want on your table. So we can see that right now, my person carrying the torch can only see what's around them. And my other person, so if I hit escape, it's going to unfocus on them, can see what's around them and what's around my, the ally over there because they're emitting light and lighting our up. But if we're far enough away, we can have this zone over here that we've explored so it's cleared from the fog of war. But if there was a monster in here, we'd have no clue. Let's get into what I think is one of Foundry's strongest features, and that's the walls system. So as I'm zooming in here so that I can see nicely, we can see that we have a bunch of different walls here on the left tab, which is fourth down. We have regular walls that players will be able to see, rather they cannot see through and they cannot walk through. So if I hit my up arrow, I won't go through. Now as the game master, I can always override that. Next up, we have an invisible wall. So I won't be able to walk through that, but I will be able to see through it. Then we have our ethereal walls, which only matters if there's more than one. 
So here I'm going to do a two layer of this. I'm holding control to create a chain. You can see that although snap was, is on, I was slightly off there and I created this wall. So I just hover and I hit delete. Let's move these. They all line up nice and neat. There are five snaps to a side of a square giving you 25 snaps per square. It's very nice system in my opinion. Next up is our ethereal wall. We will not be able to see through it, but we will be able to walk through it. So this is for like walls of fire and other stuff. And we have our doors. The player will be able to see and control this type of door, but then we have our secret door. The players will think that the secret door is a normal wall. And we have clone. If we double click on any of these, it will open up a configuration screen that allows us to customize the features. Then the clone mirrors wherever the last features were. So with this player, we can see that we cannot see or walk through that first wall. Second wall, we can see through but not walk through. Then this third wall over here, we can see through one but not two of. This one we cannot see through but we can walk through. Here we have a door we can open and another door. The difference between these doors being if we were to switch to the player view, this would look like a normal wall, like over here, but this one, uh, I had that other way around, this is the secret door. So this would look like just a normal wall, but for a game master we could open it and it looked like it's completely open. As a game master you can also right click to lock it, at which point it will just make a sound when the players click on it, and it won't actually open. And then you can right click on it and then the players will be able to click in and out as normal. You also have the space ball which will pause the game. Pausing the game is great for if you want to like pause doors and movements so the players don't go on while you prep whatever comes next. So the walls is most likely the most powerful feature here. A lot of people also really enjoy being able to create light nodes so that you can have like a campfire that emits light and you can, your players can see it from way far away which is kind of cool. You can set these to be either local or global. If it's global, it'll shine straight through walls and illuminate the other side. You can do the same thing with sound effects, pinning them to the map. And personally, this is my favorite feature here. Because by having sounds that are pinned, you can have a growling of a monster that gets louder the closer you get. Or the side of a river actually sounding like a river. We can also pin journal entries to the map. So let's start off by creating a journal entry. And this is going to be a riddle, which I'm going to edit the contents of. And we're going to have the riddle itself. And then we're going to create a new format, custom secret answer. So what this is going to do, so if I pin this to the map, say on that locked door, Oh, I forgot to conform. So say it was unlocked or here, and we could choose all sorts of different things. Maybe it's a mountain icon or whatever. And if we have this active, then the players will be able to see that and click into it from whatever tab they're on. That answer section, there's a slightly different color, is a secret. So only the owner, i.e. in this case the game master, can see that. Now, if you actually were to give ownership to them, they'd be able to see it. But why would we give them ownership? The object is an interesting thing for now. Uh, think of it as your way of creating a tile on the map. And this tile can be filled with an image or sprite. So you can have your sprite file of a camp file that's moving and glistening and the, as it burns. Long term, Atropos has a thing called a triggering system that's planned. That would be really cool because you'll be able to step on one tile and teleport to another great for going up staircases, or you'll be able to do things like have a tile that when you step on it plays a soundtrack once to give that mouth of magic taunt that speaks out from thousands of years ago and gives a hint for what's going on and then you need to communicate that with your allies. The second tab down is for all those combat things like if we had a fireball or cone breath or whatever we happen to need, it gives us lots of different ways of drawing this out and of course the delete all button. Those are the main buttons over here. Up at the top is going to be all of your different scenes, which you might have a lot of. And you can always come in here and configure and turn some of them off so they're not so crowded up there. And you can turn them back on from over on your scenes tab. 
The combat trackle can have people put into it. Let's start off by adding some monsters. So I'm opening up the bestiary that comes by default. Let's add some of these things. So like here we can see we just add that dragon ledge and if we add a second one it's going to add a second one. We don't really want that. Even if we're doing multiples here what we want is multiple tokens going to the same actor. So if we change something on the actor to be changed on all of them. But, but you want the health separate? Well the cool thing here is we're going to configure this the same way we did the characters things earlier. So they'll have their own health that always shows up. The difference here is that over on the character tab we're going to leave this unchecked and that means that they're not going to share the same health. They'll each have their own health and we're going to leave this unchecked because we don't want our vision changing when we click on an NPC. But with that set up now when we put the Draconda Lynches on here they each have their own HP and so if we were to right click on them and say this guy gets a minus 50 and this poor guy gets a minus 300. You see that it stops at zero because that's the low HP in D&D. &D. We can have that set up to other things because I know some rule sets go underneath that. But by default in the 5e system that's how it works. You can also set up other tokens. That panel I'm opening now, you open by right clicking on the token. It's also how you right click and add them all to the combat tracker which was the second tab in here. If you want, we could right click it to pop it out and move it around. We can wall and we can even say in a unique path. My favorite is attributes.ac.value which is going to show us all AC values right there and easy to remember. Of course we can add in our player who doesn't have his AC configured yet. Poor guy. ACs of zero would make it tough. You could click them all or you could click war all or there is a war in PCs. You can also have multiple encounters going. If you're in a league system with multiple game masters that's nice. Or you can even pre-play in your encounters. Depends on how you want to do that. You're going to end up with a bunch of actors in here. The good news is you do have the ability to make folders, color code them, stick folders inside of other folders, and lots of other ways to do some really nice data management. This is our items section. This is where we're going to stick all of the stuff like classes, races, features, class attributes, uh, weapons, spells. Essentially anything you add to an actor would go in here and you can drag and drop it onto the character sheet. There's also by default a good amount in here. If we just drag over the druid, we see that it doesn't actually give us anything there. Not in the vanilla version at least. If you look at my mod, it gives quite a bit if we do stuff like that. Here, we need to pull out our books and look up what does a druid get at different levels. So, there's Wild Shape, for example. And we could drag over Wild Shape. And it knows that we have two uses. And we can mark those as we use them. Or we can stick them up in the primary resources slot as Wild Shape. Marking as a 2 of 2, and it comes back on short or long rest. So that when we take, let's say we spent those, and then we take a short rest, they come back. And it shows in the chat that they were used and came back. So there's all sorts of different things we can be doing. There's, um, in addition to that, we have the journal tab that I've shown you. And again, we can do folders, nested, color coded. This is where you're going to keep track of a lot of your world data. And you might want to show some sections and not others, which the secret text there works well for. Music notes, although I prefer pinning them to the map, sometimes it's nice to have a sound effect that plays regardless of what your players are looking at. And then the compendium, and these are the defaults that come with it. And that's all of the basic vanilla version I'm going to go into right now. You can innately just like go into your character sheet and start adding items and add in whatever homebrew you happen to want here, or add classes, or do all of this. And there's a lot of data in here that we can manage and organize and keep track of. But what I really want to show you next, which will be in the next video, is what happens when we start turning on the rest of the data that I've been working on and comes in my module. Thank you guys for watching. Like this video and keep watching the series.
Make sure to share it with your friends and let's have fun together. God bless. Bye.